you tend to write very ambivalent uh, uh, characters. Your characters aren't just good or bad, but they are uh, equally uh, attractive and uh, repulsive. Uh, do you think that uh, the, react the director or the screenwriter doesn't need to give moral guidance to their story? Moral what? Moral guidance. That, uh, he hasn't has to say what's good or wrong. You write, you write complex characters. Thank you. Do you think the morality, you should uh, concentrate on the morality of those characters or the complexity or the depth of well, the characters? You know, look at Savages, you haven't seen it, but the morality line changes for all the actors. Some of them are very immoral and some of them start very moral. They think they are good, doing good. Morality is generally a question of your appetites and your uh, aversions. As I think, it was, I think it was Thomas Hobbes who said that. But uh, you know, what we're comfortable with, we call moral. <laughs> and uh, I think in the Savages movie, the young man, uh, Aaron Johnson, uh, who was a Buddhist uh, and a, uh, a Bono type, he's doing good. He's growing marijuana legally, and he's spreading, spreading good things around the world. He's doing foundational work in Africa and Asia. And see where he goes in the movie. He goes to another extreme. He becomes a, a, a beast. Uh, and I think, uh, on the other hand, the ruthless Salma Hayek, uh, who will kill without compunction, has very vulnerable when it comes to her daughter and is willing to break her own rules. So I, you know, I think I'd be very careful about the word morality. It's, been a it's a tricky word, and it means so much to different people. It's one of those words that like uh, an Orwell, George Orwell type of word that gets misused by governments. Uh, everyone defines their own morality. Okay, thank you. There is a question there. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, uh, secondary characters. As you said, it's that's the hardest part or one of the toughest parts of uh, writing a script. Uh, when you develop a story with eight, ten, or more characters, <coughs> do you first uh, prepare short descriptions? I'm not talking about the main characters. That's quote unquote easy. I'm talking about the th three-dimensional uh, secondary characters. Do you first, before you delve into the script, write for yourself uh, characters, pin them down, and then? go from there? Not in the way you think. I mean, it, it depends on the source. Sometimes there's books, sometimes there's a screenplay, sometimes it's somebody you know, so. No, characters it, that you yourself develop, I mean. Yeah, well, no single, the character might be in a book, but by the time you finish developing it, it doesn't resemble quite that character. You're talking about an, uh, somebody from fa who's famous, you mean? No, just a story that original story that you develop with someone or by yourself uh, and I'm talking about secondary characters who you have to make up out of your own imagination right. whether you first pin down these characters and write as much as you know about them and then you start the story or as the story develops you um, put more flesh on them I, I would say to you, uh, I would take the shortcut on that, and I would develop, try to get the main action going with the, the main characters. I would not, a novelist who's got a few years could spend uh, writing notebooks of detail, and often that will come to, come to very little, but that seems more like a novelistic technique. I would not spend that much time on it. Because, How about uh, the physical attributes? Like sometimes uh, yes, sometimes no, but I would be careful because when you finish the casting process, the act, uh, an actor may walk in who has no resemblance to what you thought the actor should be. So I think you have to keep it a little bit looser in your mind. But I would, by the, before your movie starts shooting, I would start to think about everybody in the movie in more depth. In other words, there is that clo the, the closing out of that script is very important. It, in other words, the whole script is not really finished until it gets green lit and it gets cast. Then you really go back to work, and you go back to the, to the boards, and you're working, working, up through rehearsal, and then on the, on the set, I actually am 
rewriting, but I'm tr within a certain structure, a limitation of money, structure, budget. And then, as Andy said, the editing process is a rewrite. And that happens a lot, where you can actually re-loop things. You put voiceovers if you want. You cut scenes, or you move. Let's say you move a scene from that's as early in the film to late, or more likely from late in the film early because you want to jam it. So you've moved the entire scene up. That is fucks up all, you know, you've done all your little thousands of notes. What good is that? Because now you've completely brought in a new, the, uh, several characters up, up front in the movie because you want it to go faster. You're facing yourself. It, you can trap yourself. You can trap yourself. You have to, you know, there's an old saying, uh, uh, loose and tight, loose, tight. You got to keep that balance between loose and tight. You can't be over tight. If you start making notebooks of people, and they, <laughs> you sometimes will waste a lot of your energy, creative energy, uh, having done outtakes, if you know what I'm trying to say. I think loose and tight. You have a vision, but it's not complete. Paint it in later. Get going. Make, get the action going. Get the story going. Make it interesting. Then paint it in. Paint it in. OK? When it comes to dialogue, and when you don't direct the movie, as in Scarface, for example, do you mind if the uh, dialogue that you have carefully chiseled or written uh, gets changed in the process, or you think no, it? no, not that carefully. I'm not. I'm not one of those guys. And there's are there are a lot of guys and girls who are laboriously uh, dedicated to preserving their dialogue. Uh, that could be a guy like uh, what you call Aaron Sorkin. You know, he prides himself on all the director has to do is call action and cut when he sees one of my screenplays. You know, that's another way of working. You know, and Hitchcock might also say, you know, I make the movie, not the writer. You know, there's all these kind of ego-ridden notions, but uh, not at all. If yeah, Al, Pacino, original... Al Pacino is an actor who knows what he can do, and so many of the actors know what they can do well, if they can often make suggestions, and I'm fine with it. But in the original Wall Street, there are some big speeches that seem to be at least very well written. How much was the contribution of Michael Douglas uh, to... No, he didn't. Uh, he was not. Uh, Michael was uh, on his... Uh, was uh, barely keeping up with that. You know, he was... He'd never done that kind of work. So he was uh, struggling. And we, uh, he got more and more confidence as he went. But he does, Michael's the kind of actor who does the lines. He's not a, an actor who's uh, reworking them. Whereas uh, so some actors, like Benicio Del Toro, he will always come in and say, maybe it makes more sense this way, or I should change it. I mean, it's OK. They're both different types of actors. I will use Michael Douglas, and I'll use Benicio the best I can. And sometimes, or Salma Hayek is filled with ideas. And I like that. It's fine. We discuss them, and if it makes sense, uh, we'll go with it. If it doesn't make sense, you'll see it. But you need a director who can talk back and say, well, why are you doing this? This is the way it was done. Well, can you explain to me why you want to do it this way? Patience is required, but it is a debating, a chess game. It is a debating society. And no, and no director who is impatient with, uh, no director who is impatient with his actors I believe can succeed, you have to uh, deal with them. And you have to answer their questions as, as clearly as you can. And if they make you think, rethink your thing, you see, they're collaborators. That's what makes it, you see, that's why I don't buy the writer in isolation for a long time coming back with, it has to be this way. It seems to me that's a recipe for a great deal of pain. Thank, Thank you. you. There, there are many questions here. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, wait for the microphone, please. Just because of the translator. OK, until then, uh, write, writing habits, please. Uh, do you write every day? How many pages? And uh, do you have a favorite place or time for writing? How was it in the 70s for you? How is it today? Uh, when I was a uh, screenwriter, I wrote uh, two sessions. Uh, almost six hours a day. And uh, I liked uh, very much uh, late morning and then late afternoon to early evening. 
as I got more and more busy with the directing, I would say my, I would either have to write on late afternoons would be my favorite, uh, and sometimes in the, into early night. Uh, I function, I think with the eyes, the ideas for me come best in the after, as the day goes. I'm not an early morning person. Uh, I can barely function sometimes. But uh, everyone's different. Uh, I think a lot of writers like to write early so they can go out and get drunk in the afternoon. <laughs> same, tr same is true about edi editing, too. I like editing is very, in uh, very intense work uh, for me. And I go to the editing room later in the day. Whereas shooting production is all day. It's painful, but it's like your 60 or 80 days of pure marching. It's like, I know, it's like being in, the, in an army because you're all part of a group. So you're up early and you're working all day long. But you can't keep up the same pace. It's a different kind of uh, production because you're working with so many people. It's not like the solitary art of editing or uh, writing. As to now, uh, you know, I don't write every day because uh, life has become rather complicated with age. But I do, I tell you what I did do is I keep a diary so I, I, I try to write in the diary, as, for sure, at least once a week, I try to catch up with all the events. So that gets, that focuses me very, I find that very difficult, actually, diary writing. And it's, I've been doing it for almost 30 years now. And I have, I used to do it every day, but time runs out, more complexity. And, but at least I write. I'm all, I, I think the act of being alone and writing, if you're not writing a movie, at least write a diary. And a lot of letters, too, by the way. A lot of letters. And I, I'm very punctilious about my letters. I hate my letters to be sloppy. It's your turn now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you went to uh, film school to NYU. And I'm sure that there, just as uh, for us at Columbia University, they were hammering in screenplay structure, drama structure, whether it's a three-act structure or four-act or uh, various dramatic points. My question is, um, after these, man, these many years of experience and working in the industry as a writer, director, do you still go back uh, to the uh, process and when you have notes or an outline or a treatment, do you uh, look at it from a little bit from the distance and see, did I get the structure right? Do you analyze your work that way or you just more go with uh, the flow and what you feel? No, I think it's important that you keep notes. I think there is, an, you keep notes at the origin, you keep notes as you go. I do a lot of paperwork. Uh, it becomes stacks. And I'm not saying it's easy to go back and reread everything, but th it's often very valuable as you get closer on your editing uh, process that you might refer back. Very, very fruitful to refer back to your notes from the beginning before you started casting and shooting. And often you will find things that are pro uh, solutions to problems that were there the whole time. Sometimes, as, as I said, in the first draft, it can be the best. Uh, and sometimes it can get rewritten and does not have the same vigor, you see. So pay attention to your notes. My problem, like with all uh, security agencies, is that I have so many notes at a certain point that it's, you, it's just how do you, how do you uh, imbibe them all? You know, you, so I try to thin them out as I go and throw out the stuff. That seems self-evident, but I'm sure I've thrown out some mistakes too. How do you deal with the notes that come from the studios, the studio executives? That's not my forte, uh, but uh, sometimes they're very good. They're very good indeed, and you pay attention to everything. The notes do come, uh, and by the way, uh, I listen and I go to previews uh, sometimes. Previews for the movies, which are very difficult. It's a hard thing to sit through a preview because an audience is sitting through one time. You know the movie in depth, you've seen it, you know all the nooks and crannies, but the audience, they don't know all your problems. They're just sitting and is it good or not, you know. So it's a very tough experience. And, uh, but it's, I, it, well, an executive once said to me, I think it was good advice, he said, you know, when you go to these things, if you have a doubts in your, in your mind about the film you made, and you hear it echoed in the, uh, by the uh, members, some members of the audience, pay attention. If they're off on another tangent and it has nothing to do with, you have no doubt about it, ignore it. And I think that was, because sometimes these sessions can get crazy with the audience. You know, somebody would, they just don't get it, they don't connect. 
So you can chase, by the way, previews can destroy movies. You can chase an audience. Uh, I know some directors who preview repeatedly, like nine, ten times. Uh, and who knows? I mean, some movies have been butchered as a result. Comedy people uh, who have, uh, comedy people tend to love previews because they want to make sure they get the same laugh at the same place. That's important. Then they know they're locked. Okay? That's a little different because my movies are not necessarily laughable movies. So my movies tend to be silent. Uh, I mean, people sit quietly and hopefully on the edge of their seat and you feel it. And also, if you pay attention to a preview, you can also feel it when they get bored. There's that restlessness, you know. So, but sometimes it's very confusing. It's hard. It's not easy. Thank you. Andy, you're a master of previews. What do you think? No, seriously, you've previewed a lot. Do you, you've seen more than I have. Well, that, I think there are two parts to a preview that are very different. One is that uh, you sit there with the audience and you watch the audience while you're responding to the movie or how they respond to the movie, and that's very helpful for me. It tells me when they're restless, it tells me when they're there, when they're sitting at the edge of their seat, or when they're bored to death. You can feel it and you can see it. Then comes the second phase when they write the notes, okay? And the writing the notes is already not part of the preview, but it's already being a critic. And that part of it is usually wasted. But watching the movie with an audience for the first time out is a very uh, difficult experience, as you say, because you think you have it right when you're gonna preview it. And the preview give, uh, raises every doubt in the world, whether you were sane to do this at all. I would, uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think you're, but I, I, there are situations when some, act, some directors do not want a preview. I will give you one where I had finished uh, JFK and I did it against the clock. We, were, had, we had a due date of December and we were finished the movie in July, believe it or not. So this is a very complicated movie. And we were, flying, and uh, one studio executive, Bruce Berman, you remember him? He, and he said, we gotta preview this movie, you know, it's three hours and 10 minutes, uh, eight minutes in Pasadena. And uh, I said, absolutely not. I said, if you wanna preview the movie and I make one change, we're never gonna make that date. And Terry Samuel backed me and they, they, he backed down. Because I knew that that movie was so big, so confusing, to some people, that there would be always some people in the audience who would say, what the fuck is this about? How does that connect to that? How and the moment you start to disconnect the movie, the, it would have come apart. It had to be the way it was, and I just knew it. So I fought them, and uh, Bruce Berman always hated me for that, and never gave me a job when he got to Village Roadshow. <laughs> but, but previews, you see, in this country are very rare. Somehow people are very uncomfortable with it. They don't want to do it or they just don't want to spend the time. They don't want to learn from the audience. Uh, a lot of people think audience is not important at all because they're making the movie for themselves. And I think all that is really what part of what we're trying to change here, or at least I'm trying to change, to make sure that those directors and those ride these writers are able to communicate with their audiences to affect them in some way scare him, make him laugh, thrill him, but give him some sort of sensation and excitement, I think. Thank you, and we got the message. Yeah. <laughs>